Good afternoon and welcome to our program called The Declining Caseload Trends of the New York Court of Appeals. Uh, this is a panel discussion presented by the CCAJ, which is more formally known as the Committee on Courts of Appellate Jurisdiction of the New York State Bar Association. I am Michael J. Miller. I am the chairperson of that committee at this time. Uh, this program is being presented both live and via electronic means. Um, we know that there are distinguished jurists uh, watching this program and the committee appreciates their attention to it, um, but I cannot spend the time singling any of them out for specific recognition. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Our panelists today, in no particular order, but from your left to right, are William Caston is the assistant attorney in charge, appellate advocates in New York. He devotes his expertise to appellate advocacy in criminal cases. Uh, next to him is the Honorable Eugene F. Piggott, likewise a, a, a well, a former associate judge of the New York State Court of Appeals, uh, who not only served on the Court of Appeals, but the, pres the presiding judge of the Appellate Division, Fourth Department. Next is Professor Patrick M. Connors. He is the Albert and Angela Ferrone Distinguished Professor in New York Civil Practice at Albany Law School. It's because of titles like that that I can't mention our distinguished guests. Uh, next is the Honorable Rosalind H. Richter. She was a judge in the state court system for about 35 years. Uh, her most recent position was an Associate Justice of the Appellate Division First Department. And from 2020 onward, she is Senior Counsel at Arnold Porter K. Scholler. Uh, the Honorable Robert Smith is also a former Associate Judge of the New York State Court of Appeals. He is currently senior counsel to Friedman, Kaplan, Seller, and Alderman. And last but certainly not least is Brian J. Shute. He is a partner at Sullivan, Pappen, Block, McGrath, Cofinas, and Canavo, and he focuses his practice on appellate advocacy in civil cases. Our moderators for today's program are the Honorable Denise A. Hartman, Acting Justice of the Supreme Court, Albany County and James Edward Pelzer, who spent almost 40 years in various posts in the state court system, and he retired from being the clerk in the Appellate Division, Second Judicial, Judicial Department. I turn this presentation over to the moderators. Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Jim Pelzer. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the declining dispositions of the New York Court of Appeals um, and the impetus for this um, meeting was um, a law review article that was written by Tom Newman and myself. I'd like to introduce you to Tom Newman. Tom um, graduated from uh, New York University, was uh, a law clerk to Judge Frozell in the Court of Appeals from 1960 to 1962. And since then, he's been one of the deans of appellate practitioners in New York State for the last 60 years or so. And um, he's a superb lawyer, and I can testify to that because for the last 10 or 12 years, we worked together on a team uh, uh, involving a rather complex litigation. So Tom and I wrote this uh, article. Uh, it was read by a, a number of people and uh, they thought they developed some concern about the declining uh, dispositions. We tried in the article not to take any position on it. We're just like in Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. And so that if you read the article, you'll see it was just the facts. Today, we're gonna seek some opinions about those facts. And before we, we start with that, 
I'm going to review, the, review some of them with this um, PowerPoint presentation. So here we go. Um, first thing we need to do, talk about is very briefly the history of the Court of Appeals. The, 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 the Court of Appeals um, has, there are three historical uh, eras of the Court of Appeals. Uh, and they're divided by the implementation of the fourth constitution of the state in 1896 and by the adoption of uh, chapter 300 of the laws of 1985, which reduced the um, uh, as a right jurisdiction of the Court of Appeals. So during these first two eras, the court was kind of overwhelmed with a very heavy caseload, which we'll talk about for a few minutes. Then there were various steps that were uh, taken to manage and constrain that caseload, and they involved adding more judges to the Court of Appeals, changing the court's purpose significantly, and limiting appealability as a right. So let's go over those changes. In the first era, the Court of Appeals was the successor to a thing called the Court for, uh, for the Trial of Impeachments and the Correction of Errors, and it inherited a very heavy caseload from that in 1847. It served, and this is something to think about, it served as a sec full second tier of appellate uh, review, which is to say it had the power to review f issues of fact and a law and discretion, and aggrieved parties could take appeals as a right to the Court of Appeals from final judgments after they review, were reviewed by the Intermediate Appellate Court, which was called the general term. And they, uh, the, there was a temporary commission on appeals, which was created in the 1870s to deal with its very heavy backlog. That didn't work very well. In 1888, there was like a, almost a disaster. So they created a second division of the Court of Appeals. Um, and that didn't work well. And in the 18, early 1990s, uh, thoughts uh, turned to changing the jurisdiction of the court and making significant uh, changes to the court. In, in 1894, there was a constitutional convention. And the, the uh, thoughts about the court system in New York were uh, referred to the Judiciary Committee, which was chaired by Elihu Root, who was a very famous New York lawyer. He, in fact, after 1894, he became the Secretary of War under McKinley and the Secretary of State under uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And what's more, he's a very good writer. And in your materials, you'll see this document the, the, from among the reports of the Constitutional Convention, the report of the Judiciary Committee. And it's very, very important. It's worth reading. It's only a couple pages long. So what did that report do? It abolished the general terms, which were ad hoc courts. They came together to, uh, part time to determine appeals. It created the appellate division and divided the appellate division into four departments as full time courts uh, in the place of the, uh, the general terms. And it changed the purpose and the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeals. So it's worth understanding exactly what the nature of those changes were. The, in, in 1894, they determined that the system of having two full appeals as of right what, didn't work. It just overloaded the Court of Last Resort. So they concluded that their, the state was only obliged to provide one full review of, uh, uh, of a trial. And the appellate division was created to, to provide that review and given full power to review issues of law, fact, and discretion. The system of allowing aggrieved uh, uh, litigants to a successive appeals with, and to consider all those issues was abolished because the existence of the second appeal diminished the importance and finality of the first. So then they said, well, why do we need a court of appeals? We don't need them. We got the appellate divisions to take care of things. And then they said, well, you know, there's going to be four appellate divisions and they're certain to disagree. And uh, those four will, courts will never be um, able to settle the law of New York and, uh, because their opinions are certain to differ and conflict. So this is why they concluded they needed to have a court of appeals. The public issue interest demanded that the law should be settled that it should be the same for the whole state, that it should be consistent and harmonious, that it should be declared clearly and authoritatively by some supreme power in the form of the Court of Appeals. So after the Court of Appeals uh, uh, was reestablished, sort of its purpose changed in 1889 in Reed versus McCord, 
they, had, they, they decided this case, and, it, and their, the first sentence here is interesting. The Constitutional Convention clearly entertained the opinion that the continued existence of the Court of Appeals was justified only by the necessity that some tribunal should exist with supreme power to authoritatively declare and settle the law uniformly throughout the state. And uh, Judge Cardozo, in his treatise on the Court of Appeals from 1903, said, the theory of the court's jurisdiction, our judicial system, is not of declaring justice between man of man, but of settling the law. So here comes the second era. The fourth constitution became effective in 1896. Um, and again, the court's jurisdiction was issued to uh, issues of, limited to issues of law alone. Uh, in 1899, it still hadn't worked to reduce the caseload. So in 1899, there was another, 1899, there was another constitutional amendment in which the, the proponents of that uh, amendment concluded that we needed to uh, have the ability for the governor to designate more additional judges to the Court of Appeals until its caseload was reduced reduced to about 200. They thought that 200 was a, an appropriate caseload for the Court of Appeals. And just like in the appellate divisions, additional justices were, or judges were uh, named to the Court of Appeals, and they served till 1923. In 1917, they said, well, that's not working well enough, so you know what we'll do? We'll cut down the jurisdiction. We'll get rid of appeals as a right from affirmances, and we'll leave only a limited number of grounds for appeals as it right, in which, one of which was a single dissent by the judges at the appellate division or a reversal or modification at the appellate division. Uh, so in 1926, there was a, a change to criminal jurisdiction. All criminal cases thereafter required leave of, of a judge or a, of the court of appeals or a justice of the appellate division. So, that worked for quite a while until about uh, 1960, the mid-1960s, early 70s, and um, the caseload of the Court of Appeals increased drastically. So uh, the Court of Appeals requested the American Judicature Society to do a study of appellate justice in New York. And uh, Bob McCrate, Judge Hopkins from the Second Department, and Maurice Rosenberg from the from Columbia Law School prepared this report. And they made recommendations which essentially said, uh, let's turn pretty much everything into a, an appeal as of, uh, uh, by leave court. Um, that, there were some people who uh, did not agree with the recommendations of the, the Crate Report. And one of those, or one of the groups that did not agree was the uh, Committee on Courts of Appellate Jurisdiction. And our own Tom Newman uh, spoke about this. And one of the things that happened was not all the uh, recommendations of the McCrate report were adopted. Um, the, um, uh, the threshold for leave to appeal as a right based on a uh, dissent at the appellate division was increased to two uh, judges uh, d dissenting on the law, but otherwise most of the appeals as a right were terminated. So now we're going to take a look at the statistics that we reviewed. In, in our uh, article, we, re we used the annual reports of the clerk of the court. There are 42 of them from 1980 to 2021. Those are the ones we looked at, and those are the ones I've confined this talk to. There's a new one out for uh, uh, 2022, and we'll talk a little bit about the statistics in that a little bit later. So the statistical analysis of an appellate court has to take into a lot of things. It's not just dispositions. You have to think about intake, which is motions uh, in civil cases for leave to appeal and criminal leave applications in criminal cases. Then you have to consider the dispositions of the matters before it. Then you need to consider the way in which um, the appeals are disposed of, whether or not they do, they have a simplified manner of disposing of appeals or, uh, uh, and then the nature of the writings of the dispositions that are handed down. So. One thing we, I, I did want to mention beforehand is, and we should uh, take a look at, is that there are many, many filings in the trial courts. And this um, uh, chart at the bottom, which some will um, be able to read probably online here, a little more difficult. It turns out that from 2016 to 2021, the average number of filings in the trial courts was 2,837,000. And during that time, the average uh, appellate division dis, uh, decisions was 15,900. And the average number of court appeals decisions was 
only 133. So it, a tiny fraction of the cases which are commenced in the trial courts eventually make it to the Court of Appeals. So uh, from 2016 to 2021, you have to take a look and decide how a case is getting to the Court of Appeals. And uh, the question is, how many come as of right and how many come as by permission? So the averages over that, that time from 2016, 2021 is that 82% of the cases before the Court of Appeals came as a result of permission. 51% came from permission granted by the, uh, the Court of Appeals or a judge of the Court of Appeals and only 29% came from permission by a, a justice of the, just, the justices of the appellate division or a judge of the appellate division. And so you can see uh, in this chart at the bottom here, this is 2016 when leave grants probably came in in 2015. There are many, many uh, grants by court of appeals judges. And you can see that starting in 2016, 2017, leave grants by the court of appeals judges, which are in blue, tailed off and then also the grant leave grants, which are in orange uh, by, the, by the appellate division tailed off and uh, appeals as of right tailed off a little bit, probably because of uh, COVID towards the end. Um, so one of the important questions we're gonna talk about today is what makes an appeal leave worthy? So, um, the statutes and the rules governing leave to appeal don't give a lot of guidance except for the rules of the Court of Appeals, Section 522b4, which says that you should show, if you're making an application for leave to appeal, the, why the questions presented such that the issues are novel or of public importance, present a conflict with prior decisions of this court, or involve a, a conflict among the departments of the appellate division. The, the uh, rules of the appellate divisions don't give any guidance, really. They just say, tell us why you want to appeal and tell us why you think it's important. So one of the things we might want to mention today that I asked our panel is, what, what, is there some difference between the concept of leave worthiness in the Court of Appeals and in the appellate divisions? So now comes the control of uh, grants of leave to appeal. In 2018, there was an article in the Law Journal about uh, Judge De Fiore pressing the appellate divisions to send fewer appeals to the, the High Court. The usual way this occurred in the past, and it's well documented, the, um, the public information officer of the uh, Court of Appeals said this had been going on for years. Uh, and the way it happened was usually the chief judges, judge spoke to the presiding justice at administrative board hearings and said, uh, you fellows are, your, your judges are granting an awful lot of leave and we would like to decide for ourselves, so can you knock it off a little bit? But this very unusual uh, report from in the Law Journal says in 2016, Judge De Fiore went to visit the judges in the uh, Appellate Division First Department for lunch and said to them, please don't grant leave. And then they tailed off a bit, but not that much. So in 2018, out came this uh, article in the Law Journal. And after that, uh, grants by most of the appellate divisions really tailed off. It's important to note, however, that the Constitution specifically grants both the appellate division and the Court of Appeals the power to grant leave. And it grants additional power to the appellate division, which the Court of Appeals does not have, to grant leave from non-final orders, interlocutory orders in the middle of a case. And we will talk, I, or we'll ask some questions about why that's important and whether or not that should form some uh, part of the calculus in grant, deciding whether to grant leave. And uh, in non-capital criminal cases, leave to appeal to the Court of Appeals has to be granted by a judge of the Court of Appeals or by a judge of uh, uh, a justice of the appellate division. Um, so let's take a look at the civil motions for leave to appeal. You'll see the blue line indicates all the, the uh, motions that were made. The gray uh, indicates the, um, the denied. The, the, the yellow line is the dismissed, and the granted are way down at the bottom. And you'll see over here, the way I'm moving the cursor, from 2000 to, to 2000, 2016 to 2021, they 
drastically tailed off. And you can see it more graphically in percentages um, during the Lipman era, which is this section here, um, leaves were pretty much granted in civil cases between six and 8% of the time. In during the De Fiori era, they were granted between two and 4% of the time, a, a major change. Uh, here, are the, here, here are the stats of the annual leave motions made uh, in blue and the grants, uh, usually 111 under Judge Wachler, 87 under Judge Kay, 69 in civil cases under Judge Lipman, 28 under uh, Judge De Fiori. Uh, and I should say, uh, this is not an aimed at the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals or any one of them. There are different grounds, different reasons to do things, and their reasons may have changed. So we're not, although it's convenient to aggregate uh, statistics on the basis of the era in which a Chief Judge was um, in office, um, it doesn't necessarily correspond to the statistics. But in this case, it does leave to appeal grants by civil grief, leave to appeal grants dropped off drastically in the last six years. Here are the criminal leave applications. Um, and you see the same colors and numbers, but what, what you might take an uh, interest in is, you see how low they are along here? This is uh, Kay and Lippman, uh, 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 Judge Kay. This is Judge Lippman. You see this little hill here? That translates into this mountain of increased um, leave grants. So leave grants in um, criminal cases uh, during Judge Lippman's tenure was up around between four and 5%, whereas now it's between one and 2% or less than 2%. Uh, the annual criminal leave grants by, uh, by tenure of chief judge, you can see 3%, 2%, four and, and a quarter percent under Judge Lippman down to 1.43% under um, Judge DeFiori's tenure. So here are the dispositions by case type. And this, I, I show you this, it's, it looks like pretty much the same ten data, but a couple of things I want to call your attention to. This drastic drop off is in 1985 with the passage of chapter 300 uh, of the laws of 1985, in which the jurisdiction of the court appeals was reduced and in which single judge dissents no longer got you to the court of appeals. So this falling blue line is the, the requirement that you have two, um, two judge dissents on the law at the appellate division. Now, if you look at this, you'll see, um, uh, here's the, the hill that's created by the additional uh, leave grants in criminal cases by, uh, uh, during the uh, Lippman area. And here, for the first time ever, that statistics are being kept, the orange line being the, the criminal, uh, uh, criminal dispositions, there the criminal dispositions for the first time exceeded civil dispositions in 2021. So here are the annual average dispositions by tenure of chief judge. Um, the blue are the civils, the orange are the criminals, and the gray are the totals. And you can see total numbers dropped with Judge Wachler. Um, they averaged the total number is 220 and 233 under Judge, uh, Judges Kay and Lipton. And they sort of set a, uh, a ground that was similar to what the, uh, the, the constitutional uh, uh, proponents in 1899 suggested was 200 cases a year for the Court of Appeals. And so here under Judge DeFiori, the average is 131, which is heavily influenced by the leave grants in that first year of her term. And um, so here are the, here's the decline in dis, dis, dispositions every year, 225, 142, 136, 108, uh, 96, and 81. And here, in, remember in 2016, uh, the chief went to see the, appellate, the judges of the appellate division, and uh, gee, they, didn't, they kept granting leave. So here, here are the uh, civil grants of leave to appeal exceeded the, the civil grants of leave to appeal by the Court of Appeals for the first time. And here in 2018, uh, they again exceeded those by the Court of Appeals. And after that, uh, the judge of the appellate division got the idea and, and they dropped down to uh, lower numbers. 
So here are the, here again, these are the dispositions on the basis of jurisdiction. These are part of the statistics given by the clerk. You see these fluctuations again um, by the permission of the Court of Appeals, again dropping off at the end. Here's the, the uh, uh, by permission, uh, by the appellate division dissents, you'll see them drop off to zero. They, they uh, straggle in there over time. The light blue line is the appellate division grant, leave grants. They're very few towards the end. Uh, here are the Court of Appeals criminal uh, dispositions. Again, <coughs> that's heavily influenced by the increase in leave grants during the Lippman era. Here's a different, uh, another interesting part of their, their jurisdiction. This is the differentiated appeal management. The court uses different methods to track and dispose of appeals. The court has very uh, um, stringent uh, jurisdictional requirements, so the result is that some cases don't measure up and they are dismissed. They use the sua sponte dismissal method. Some cases present rather easier issues, and they're given fast tracking under the sua sponte merits method, and then there are regular course treatments where it's full briefing and uh, oral argument in the court. You'll see the interesting thing here is you can see them trail down, but the sua sponte merits determinations are these gray ones, and they always seem to be about the same number running between, with this exception of one year, 50, where there was 59, always between about 24 and 25, 26. And that has continued to be the case. So when this number always remains the same, but the total number of cases that are decided by the Court of Appeals decreases, the percentage of the court's determinations are done by this sua sponte merits and uh, shorter consideration, although they're supposed to be fully con considered. So it's, uh, it's just worth noting that um, towards the last five years, six years, uh, a much greater proportion of the court's determinations were made uh, using the SSM method. So, Here's a figure concocted only by myself, but I think worth uh, uh, considering. And that has to do with how coherent the court's decisions are, which is to say how, how much dissonance there is, how, how many dissents and how many concurrences are, accompany the, uh, the determinations, the decisions which determine an, an appeal. And so we're gonna take a look at that and under the Wackler Court, you can see the, the, the determinations of the court, full opinions are the dark blue, orange is memorandum decisions, and gray is um, a procurement opinions. And the, the gold and the light blue are dissents, are concurrences and dissents. So the dissonance, the, the proportion of um, concurrences and dissents to majority writings was during Judge Wackler's term about 17, 18%. Under Judge Kay's uh, leadership, about 18, 18 and a half percent. Under Judge Lippman, increased substantially to, uh, in increased substantially to about 45%, and under the Judge Di Fiori, 67%. So here's the statistics from 2021 and their latest report from 2022. Court of Appeals, motions for leave to grant, to uh, leave to appeal in civil cases, down from 4% 4, 4 to about 3%. Uh, leave grants up from 1.63% to 2.24%. The, uh, the, in the decision statistics, the decisions are slightly up uh, there, were, there were 91 in 2022 as opposed to 81, and the civil uh, decisions are up a little bit, the criminals are down. The output in writings, 84% of, of dissonance, that is to say, almost equal numbers of concurrences and dissents in 2021, and in, in 2022, that's gone down from 84% to about 51%, or about uh, half as much as uh, the decisions, uh, the majority decisions. Um, so what can we say about the statistics? 
um, there were there was from 93 to 2015 the average of about 200 to 223 from 2016 to 221 there were there were about 2.8 million cases a year filed in the trial courts about 15,000 appellate division decisions which theoretically should provide a large number of candidate cases in 2016 there was a drastic decline in the number of dispositions by the Court of Appeals, reducing to only 81 in 2021. And if you leave out uh, 2021 on the ground that it was influenced by COVID, well, 2022 is still the lowest, excluding 2021, in the recorded history of the statistics of the court. Um, the overall decline is chiefly due to fewer, fewer leave grants, and while the overall number of dispositions fell, the percentage of cases resolved by the use of this, the sui sponte merits method rose. So here are, we've come to our time for discussion. I will get out of the way. Um, here are the, some important questions which we wanted to go over. What is the number of appeals and associated business to which the court can afford meaningful attention? What's the optimal caseload? Has there been a recent diminution in the number of leave-worthy cases that, that present novel or important issues of law? Should the Court of Appeals control its own docket, or should the appellate division take an, a more active role? Should the method of granting leave to appeal in criminal cases be changed to a, a decision by a single judge of the Court of Appeals or by the court itself? Uh, what is the role of concurrences and dissents in the appellate division is there a different role for them in the Court of Appeals? Should different considerations apply in the two courts? How much decisional dissonance is appropriate and how much is too much? And do the number of cases annually heard, finally, do the number of cases annually heard by the Court of Appeals in recent years and the way in which they're decided adequately serve the public interest? And so with that, we'll turn it over to our moderator, um, uh, Judge Denise Hartman. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Thank you. I see smiles now. Sorry about that. Um, so we've chosen the members of this panel so that we could have a broad uh, uh, number of perspectives on the questions that are raised by the data that uh, Mr. Pelzer just presented. Uh, and so we have members of the court, former members of the Court of Appeals. We have a former appellate division justice. We have uh, a professor from Albany Law School, and we have two very uh, long time and experienced appellate practitioners who have argued many cases in the Court of Appeals and, and have some perspective on, uh, on the issues that we're going to talk about today. What I would like to do to begin with, before we have a much more free flowing conversation, delving into details, is give each panelist a, a, a an opportunity to make sort of an opening statement, a short opening statement, uh, addressing your perspective on the causes uh, of the decline in the caseload dispositions of the Court of Appeals from about 200 to 250 just 10 or 15 years ago to 80 or 90 in the past two years. And as I said, this is more of an overview and also allows you to introduce yourselves to the audience, uh, and then we'll really get into some of the specifics. Uh, I'd like to start with the Court of Appeals, the former Court of Appeals judges, Judge Smith. Could you take uh, the first uh, uh, dis discussion piece here? Thank you, Judge Hartman. Uh, yes, I'm happy to. What do you want me to do? Three minutes? Two. Two. All right. Uh, the, um, uh, the, and the question being, what is my perspective on the, uh, the standards? Uh, 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 no, I'm sorry, not the standards, on, the, on my perspective on the reasons for the decline. Um, it's obviously, I don't think it's that any different standard is being applied. Uh, and indeed, I'm not sure to what extent the written, the standards that are written that were up on the screen a few minutes ago uh, have ever been terribly influential. I, I, I think I was aware those standards existed when I was on the bench. I think I had read them. 
I ha uh, they were not at the forefront of my mind when I was deciding leave. Par uh, yeah, partly because things like novel and of statewide importance are so so subjective. Uh, uh, yeah, the um, uh, much uh, yeah uh, uh, and and substantial justice is even more uh, subjective. Uh, so I, I, I think that I, I found that what I was doing, what I suspect my colleagues were doing, was saying, oh, hey, that's an interesting case, or that looks important, or that uh, uh, it, it really looks like this guy, um, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to keep the language clean, so I'll say this, this guy got the short end. Um, the, um, uh, and and it, 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 it's very much subjective, and different personalities react differently. Uh, yeah, there are some some people who have a tendency to look at a case and say, "Oh God, that looks boring," and another one to say, "Hey, that's a really interesting case. And it's the same case. It's just a different a different pair of eyes uh, looking at it." Um, that accounts for some of the variation, and I think it was obvious. I think from uh, what uh, Jim Pelzer was saying that uh, 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 leadership makes a difference. That is the 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 way that the what that it, it is not trivial. Uh, what the what uh, the chief's colleagues perceive the chief to 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 want or to prefer, and uh, and that I um, uh, certainly when um, when Judge Lipman replaced Judge K uh, in um, in twenty two thousand nine I think the um, 2009, uh, the uh, it was not a coincidence that the criminal leave grant suddenly went like this uh, the uh, the civil leave grants actually went down but I think that's just that's primarily because nobody wanted to greatly increase the workload of the court, uh, and with and an increased criminal uh, uh, load almost had to mean a, uh, a civil load. Uh, a, the, uh, when uh, when Judge DiFiori replaced Judge Lippin in 2015, uh, the the line went the other way, and I really think that that was a major major effect. Uh, I being I being one of those people who likes. Uh, basically finds every case interesting and wants to take a lot of cases. Uh, I think uh, I, uh, I'm pleased to see that Judge Wilson, uh, Chief Judge Wilson, uh, 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 has a, a, seems to have a rather expansive attitude uh, to, uh, uh, to granting, uh, to, to uh, taking cases. He said he would like the court to do more, so would I, so I'm pleased with that. Thank you, Judge Smith. And I'm now going to go to Judge Piggott uh, and uh, see uh, what your views are on the causes of the decline. I, I come from a little bit of a different background. I, uh, I was uh, a trial lawyer for 25 years <clears throat> uh, before going to the appellate division Forest department. And I am very jealous of the work of the appellate divisions. In fact, uh, the little article that's in the, in the uh, handout here is half of a speech I gave at Albany Law School where I pointed out that the largest uh, appellate division in terms of cases, et cetera, is Pelzer's second department. They're a monster, they're huge. Uh, but the second largest is the fourth department. And people forget that. They think the first is, the first is third and the fourth, or the, the third is fourth in terms of, of volume of cases. A lot of that is because the fourth department has Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Utica, and a number of uh, cities besides uh, uh, 22 counties, and uh, so when when I look at when I, when I looked at the uh, causes of these things, I looked at it from a point of view of very busy appellate divisions. And uh, if, there, if there's ever going to be a cure of the court system, somebody's got to do something about the second. They're overworked, they're underpaid, and they have too far to go to get everything done. Uh, but that's probably for another area. We never thought about the Court of Appeals when we're deciding our cases, and there's over 2,000 of them a year. Uh, the judges would get together, they would decide them, everybody comes up as of right. Uh, we would decide them and, and send them along, uh, and some of them would, would get to the, uh, to the Court of Appeals. When I was presiding justice, which I was uh, for the eight years, uh, there's an appellate, there's a, a, an administrative board that's consist, that consists of the four appellate division PJs, uh, the chief judge, that's the five, and then the chief judge of OCA is always there, Jonathan Lippman in, 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 uh, in my time. Uh, and Judith Kay told us, uh, we like to think that we know what cases we'd like to take. So she didn't say don't, but she said, we like to think of them and so don't decide which ones we're gonna hear. 
the rumor at the time was that the first department was acting crazy and they had people granting leave on too many cases. But uh, it's not unique uh, to Judge DiFiori that, that she apparently wanted to, uh, to limit that. Uh, we took it under advisement. I don't think we followed it. Uh, I think it, what we read it to be is don't be stupid. You know, don't, don't just because you're mad at your colleagues uh, grant something uh, for the Court of Appeals to decide. So that's the way we, uh, we looked at that. I, I uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later uh, with, with respect to criminal leave applications because uh, as, as Jim has pointed out with respect to uh, uh, the numbers, et cetera, one of the things you have to remember that with the civil cases, the real brains that decide those things is central staff. And when I, got to, when I got to the Court of Appeals and we would get a report from their central staff of 12, 14 uh, legal eagles, I would read the thing and I'd go, boom. I mean, they were so thorough, so good. And there would be a recommendation, granted or deny. And those would be given to one of the seven of us. And then we would handle them in, the, uh, in conference. And nine times out of 10, probably more than that, uh, we would go along with the analysis of our of our central staff. They were just that good. So that's how things came. The, the flip side of that, that we'll talk about later, and then I'll, because I'll shut up, is criminal leave applications. Because I would get 300 of those, as everyone else would. There's roughly 2,100 a year. I have no idea what the other six got, and they don't know what I got. So if I'm granting leave in a case, it's coming. <laughs> Whether anybody likes it or not, and if I deny leave, it's not coming, whether anybody likes it or not. So from my perspective, and I did a, I did a, a decent number of criminal uh, defense work when I was a lawyer. Uh, I don't know. I, I think of some of the judges who may not ever have seen a jury, let alone a criminal jury, let alone pick one, uh, deciding the same number of cases that I was. And I would not know. And uh, that's why I think it's got to change. And uh, we'll, we can talk about that later. Thanks, thanks, Denise. Thank you, Judge Pickett. I'm gonna uh, turn to Justice Richter at this point to give rebuttal with regard to the comments of the first department actions during, in, in granting leave during the last few years. Sure. Judge, Justice Richter, please. Sure, so I've been gone for the court for two and a half years. So obviously I don't, I haven't been there through, I think the steeper drop off. Um, I do want to just add the process in the first department was completely different than the fourth department. Central staff had absolutely no role whatsoever in leave applications. The application was given directly to the chambers of the judges who decided the case. It was not a collective discussion among all the members of the court. Um, I'm talking civil. So I, I think that's just a, a, a sort of since you wrote you know, you were part of the group writing the opinion. Um, you know the case inside and out. Um, I don't think we granted too many leave applications. I know there's, there's certainly some sense from the Court of Appeals. I think the entire time I was there, regardless of the chief judge, I think it was clear the court preferred to control its own caseload. Um, and the appellate division preferred to control its own caseload, but everything came to us. So I think we understood that um, and we still made our own decisions um, and sent cases we thought were appropriate. Um, I do think there are a couple of factors that I just wanna throw into the conversation that I know we're gonna look at later. Um, one is during my time on the court, there were fewer dissents um, as judges changed, as the philosophy of the court changed, perhaps as the PJs changed, um, so fewer dissents. I think there's been a lot of conversation in the profession, perhaps also in this committee, about the importance of the court speaking with one voice. So if you have fewer dissents, you have fewer leave grants. Um, and I don't think we talk about that enough. There are fewer trials. Um, the number of trials on the civil side has dropped off precipitously, including with ADR. Fewer trials, no issues about jury charges, motions in limine, um, 
So I think all of those are, are factors. Also, um, in the time I was on the court, I saw fewer splits among the departments. Um, the judges had statewide programs, not that anyone told anyone what to do, um, but I think there, there, there perhaps is a little more consensus across the state. Um, and, and so that's also something I think to think about. And then lastly, I'll just follow up um, on something Mr. Pelzer mentioned, and that's the SSMs, uh, because uh, you can read the tea leaves. If leave is granted by the appellate division and the Court of Appeals takes those cases and you often gives you a one sentence decision that just says affirmed, modified, or reversed, that's perhaps a message we this wasn't an issue we thought is important. And I think now that I'm on the other side of this, you do have to think as a judge about lawyer time, cost, expense. If the court's not gonna give the case a full hearing and doesn't want it, should we be sending it? So I think there are just, a, it's a multi-factor answer. Thank you, Justice Richter. I'm going to move to uh, Mr. Shute, Brian Shute, who has uh, observed the, the trends in the Court of Appeals uh, from a civil appellate advocate for many years. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, Judge, I have to confess to a feeling of ambivalence. Uh, on the one hand, there has been a, a great precipitous drop in the numbers. Um, and I think actually, uh, when you look at the, the statistics, it understates it in a couple of ways. Not only do you have civil dispositions going down to uh, below 100, but when you have the 500.11, that is the abbreviated system without briefing, without oral argument, going up to as high as one third, and you get these decisions where not only do you not get really the reason for it, but sometimes you don't even get what has been decided without going to the appellate division. It's a real drop in numbers. Also, you have various other rules that contribute, that don't show up in the statistics. For example, um, there is a line of cases, um, one of them is Hecker versus City of New York 2016. This is a rule that both uh, Judges Smith and Piggott have criticized, where the court says, we do not have jurisdiction to hear unpreserved issues. There are lots of good reasons why as a policy reason, it's generally not good to hear unpreserved issues, but jurisdiction, power, you're powerless, that's, but that doesn't show up in the, the statistics because it will show up as an affirmance, even though it decides nothing because the, the issue is unpreserved. All of that on one side. There's this old joke back to the Catskills, uh, oh, two old ladies, but sometimes it's two old men, are complaining about the food. The food is terrible, and the portions are so small. And lately, 2022, I won't name any particular decisions like, you know, Howlin' Forever, for example, but uh, lately, for some people, the portions being small might be a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Shute. All right, Mr. Kasten, from uh, who, ha who has a great deal of experience in arguing and following the trends in the criminal appeals in the Court of Appeals, I'd like to have you present your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to take the completely opposite view of Mr. Shute and, and not say that um, I have a feeling of ambivalence. I have a feeling of great worry and concern because in the criminal appeal context, the, the stakes are so high. And the way that leave is set up currently, where only one judge can make a determination, as opposed to the civil context when there are many judges viewing a civil, a civil leave application, is incredibly troubling because of these consequences. We're not talking about money, we're talking about liberty or a fair trial. And for that reason, I, I think that the drop is, I don't have any feeling of ambivalence, I have a feeling of concern for my clients. I th the, as to why the numbers are down, I think it really, the tone comes from the chief judge and that's what Judge Smith indicated. I mean, we, we, it's impossible to know unless you're on the court, 
but from, from the media reports, the chief judges who are open to granting greater leave publicly, the result follows and more leave grants are, are issued. Um, I, I think that there are definitely plenty of leave worthy issues. I see it in my office all the time that are denied. And I think part of that solution, which we'll discuss later, is changing the process for, for criminal leave applications. Understood, thank you, Mr. Kasten. And finally, but not least, Professor Connors, I would like you to give sort of an atmospheric perspective. Uh, after uh, reading these materials, listening to the other panelists, do you have any thoughts on the causes uh, for the decline in the number of, of Court of Appeals dispositions by year? And I see in February of 1991, the court heard 40 cases over seven days. In February of 2023, the court heard nine cases over three days. So I, I can't speak to the cause for that, but it's very hard for me to believe that the number of cases in our New York State court system that are leave worthy has diminished to that degree. That's number one. Number two, even if you take the position that there aren't enough leave worthy cases in 2023 as compared to 1991, there are litigants in our system and they deserve to have their cases heard promptly. My Cutter, I know you wrote an amicus brief in a case called ABAR, a very important case on general jurisdiction of corporations in New York. By my calendar, there was 16 months between the reply brief and oral argument. Another important case, ACE with mortgage foreclosure. 16 months from the reply brief being filed to oral argument. I have a problem with that. I think that the courts owe us more. And I think if the court met more often, you would see less time there. Third thing, being in the building matters. And I'm seeing Judge Kay's portrait up here. And I remember the first time I met her in 1988, I was in Judge Simon's office and I had to give him some papers. And all of a sudden, Judge, Judge Kay walked in as she then was, right? She wasn't the chief judge yet. And I just stood there in awe. And Judge Simons looked at me and he said, Pat, go in your office and shut the door, politely. And they talked. And I think being in the building matters. And I know, Judge, you would get in the night before oral argument. The more time the judges are in the building, the more time they get to talk about the cases and maybe resolve issues and develop their thinking on the law. So those would be three things I would say about the current state of affairs. Right. So the next specific question I want to address, and some of you have touched on this, is there a reason to believe that there are fewer leave-worthy cases now being presented by these leave applications 
in both levels of court than there were 10 years ago. Is there a reason to believe that? Uh, I'm going to start with Professor Connors on this one. Uh, there may be, I'm not aware of it. I don't, I don't see that the drop in cases can be explained by the fact that there are not sufficiently worthy cases. And something, Brian, you mentioned and Judge Richter, you mentioned. Um, in my area, civil practice, I see these cases go up to the Court of Appeals. Now, you mentioned the appellate division granting leave. I've seen a lot on the three, two dissents. They go up to the court and they're put on SSM. So that means there's no, it's letter briefing. You're relying on the appellate division briefs and there's no oral argument. I'll quickly give you three cases and I'll give you the citations in the New York practice book. Nelson, section 223, critical stuff, life and death, right, in civil practice. It's, does a defendant have to plead an affirmative defense? Or if the plaintiff pleads it and says, there is no standing, can the defendant sit back and just deny that? Or do they have to affirmatively plead standing? That's an important case for litigants in our system. That went on SSM. It was a two judge dissent in that case. Mid Hudson, a case out of the third department. Judge Gary dissented, it was a two judge dissent. Pleading, what could be more important to me, especially teaching our students and to young lawyers and to older lawyers, pleading a cause of action. Now, you know, the federal courts have gone and required far more pleading um, in, in their practice with uh, two cases, Iqbal is one of them. We've always had, I think, the beauty of simplicity in our pleading. If you look at the Mid-Hudson case, it requires a lot more in the way of notice, facts. Went up to the Court of Appeals, it was on SSM, it was a two judge dissent, very short opinion, affirming and not reflecting, this is a dramatic change in our law. Third thing, Brian, I know you're aware of this case, Brito, with, you know, Brian represents the plaintiff, Mike Cutter represents the defendant, and Mike Cutter wants to get disclosure of plaintiff's physical condition. What can he get? How much, Brian, did your client put in controversy? That was a 3-2 split in the first department. It noted a split with the second department, and it went up. And I think it was a one paragraph decision. And you talk to, to lawyers and judges downstate, I'm not sure that they're following Breed O'Brien. You may have a comment on that. But these are some of the additional issues I see. All right. So, uh, all right, uh, Mr. Shute. Turn your mic, please. Sorry. Last year, Judge Wilson dissented in the case, not just on the merits, but specifically on the decision to. SSM, the case in the first instance, uh, the, the name of the case was Alvarez versus Anucci, and he wrote in dissenting, it, it was a, dealt with the interpretation of the Sex Offender Registration Act. This case, which presents a fully preserved matter of first impression with implications for all persons convicted of qualifying sex offenses, meets none of the criteria for 500.11 review. It, so it, it may be, who knows, that we'll see that less frequently going forward. All right, so, so we've, you, you have examples uh, of leave-worthy cases that could have been where the Court of Appeals, in your view, could have been more helpful in establishing uh, uh, the law of the state of New York on these issues. But I, I think Justice Richter pointed out in, in her opening remarks that there may be reasons when you don't look at them anecdotally why the total numbers may be the, of leave-worthy cases are presenting themselves uh, less frequently today. So, so uh, let me jump in. I don't think there are less leave-worthy cases. I mean, I do think, I want to just add one other trend into the mix, which is uh, not all, but, but many appellate division decisions are much shorter. Um, obviously, I've been around long enough. I remember there was the affirm no opinions um, when there were no decisions. But I also think, um, Again, there's a balance. So if the appellate divisions are not writing longer decisions, uh, and, and perhaps that's a caseload issue, uh, then it's harder for the court, I would think, for the, certainly for the Court of Appeals to look at that and say, oh, there's a, a, an important issue here. 
Um, but I do think there, there are, I, I, I don't see any change at all uh, over you know the 11 years I was on the court and even now that I'm practicing in, in the number of issues. Um, so I, I guess that answers your earlier question. It, it does, thank you. Anybody else have a comment on, on that? Before I then ask the next question is, if the if there's a similar number of leave worthy issues that are being presented through the court system today has the standard for what's leave worthy changed to become more selective in recent years and so but before we answer that second question does anybody else have a different view on whether the the total number of leave worthy issues is declining uh more recently I have the same view as everybody else. The answer is no. All right. So, so let's address the next possible cause of the declining caseload trends in the Court of Appeals. And that is, is there a more selective standard for determining what is leave worthy? Um, and let's see, some notes here. I don't think I've had, um, well, let's go back to uh, Mr. Shute on that question. Well, presumably, um, if and when judges of the appellate division are told to grant leave less frequently, that has an impact. Um, there are instances, I think, where the appellate division is actually better situated to determine whether leave is warranted. And there are also in instances where they're the only court uh, the, uh, that can grant leave. Um, when you lack finality, um, generally, there's going to be no right um, of appeal under CPL 5601 until finality is achieved it, when, in the comparatively few instances when there ultimately is a right. When you have a non-final uh, de decision, it may be a very important issue of law. It may be one that if the Court of Appeals could grant leave, they would grant leave, perhaps, but they can't grant leave. They lack jurisdiction to grant leave as to non-final orders. So that's one instance where uh, the appellate division, uh, appellate division is the only court that can do so. Yes, you could say that uh, when the case, if the case ultimately comes final, leave can be granted at that point. That might be years down the road and it might be never. The other instance is you may have cases, we were talking earlier, where uh, the first department went through a series of cases where they continually flipped, basically changing the result with the composition of the bench. That's one instance where the court may feel, here is something where we really need an answer. But even apart from that instance, you may have cases like, for example, in the second department, where the court feels constrained by its own prior precedent. They're resolving cases consistently with their own second department precedent many of them because the issue recurs and yet ultimately i'm not really sure that this is a result that if the court of appeals heard it that the court of appeals would reach the same result and it's a lot of cases they're the ones who would know this issue is recurring No, uh, it didn't. Uh, although uh, one of the things that uh, occurs to me when when we talk about this, we would we would fix things uh, if there's a, if there's a three to one uh, or a four to one. Uh, it would not be unusual for someone like Judge Sam Green, if anybody knows him, to go to somebody and say, "Hey, listen, if you jump with me, we can get this thing up to the uh, the Court of Appeals," which worked kind of well. And and in the same vein, if it's four to one. Uh, it'll be five zip coming out because somebody's not going to bother writing a dissent. We were a memorandum court. Uh, on, uh, Judge Richter's right. We we rarely wrote, and when we did, it was usually because somebody would say, "Why don't you write on that? It's kind of an important issue." Uh, but we wouldn't. We we rarely thought about the Court of Appeals. I mean, uh, we would when we had something that we thought deserved it. 
but usually collegially, if we thought so, we would send it up. And if it got SSM, you know, what are you going to do? That's what they do. But when you were at the Court of Appeals, did you have a sense that what was considered leave worthy was a standard that was becoming more selective? No, I didn't think that at all. But I have to tell you, my ignorance is wide because uh, I was such a fan of the central staff. It, it, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but they have these legal eagles that are just incredible in doing jurisdiction and, and uh, doing the issue, setting it out and making a recommendation. And then when you're in conference with, you know, with your six colleagues, uh, it's very comfortable to say, yes, we ought to grant leave or no, you know, unless it's something like Happy the Elephant and we can fight about that all day long. Uh, I, I think we want to move on because I noticed we're halfway through our, our two hour time period today. And I really want to get to the next set of issues. Jim, do you want to lead the discussion on the appellate division leave grants, please? I think uh, I talked a little bit about how, uh, about this recent or 2018 uh, Law Journal article, which uh, Judge DeFiori went to the appellate division first department. And former Judge Bellicosa in the, has a, there's a, a letter from him to the editors of the Law Journal that's in our the packet of materials in which he expressed the view that the Court of Appeals is the better farm to control its docket in order to allow it to portion its finite time to the relatively most important issues and cases that fit its purpose. So I'm looking back at Judge uh, Bellicosa's idea here. I'm wondering whether or not the Court of Appeals really has that much finite time because their caseload has been so reduced. So one, you have to think that they've decided to grant leave less, and you've all expressed the view that um, there really aren't less leave-worthy cases. So, they, so in granting leave less frequently, they must be intending to use their time to do something else. Uh, and one of the things that they are doing that's different is there's a whole lot more writing and a lot more dissents and concurrences. And I, I wondered whether any of you, whether any of you come to the conclusion that that's the reason that they're cut down on leave grants or and was anybody, would anyone like to uh, discuss that? Um, uh, uh, if, if you want me to start off, I, I don't think that's the case. In fact, I, well, I made a joke about part-time to one of the co my former colleagues and he didn't appreciate it. Uh, what, what Pat Connor said, I thought is really true. I, I used to say to young lawyers when I was practicing, you may have a hundred cases, your client has one and they will talk about it. They will put their, take their kids out of school. They'll cancel vacations. They'll do whatever you tell them uh, with respect to that case. And it's the same thing with the courts. We, we may think, you know, well, we've got, you know, all these cases. These lawyers have won, and some of them are really, really important. And as, and as uh, Mr. Kasten said, you know, sometimes it's liberty interests. And for us to say, well, you know, we'd, we'd rather do something else, uh, to me, is fantastical. It, it just doesn't make any sense. But, but you know, I'm, I haven't been there in a while, so I don't know. Well, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about was the, the Constitution very clearly grants the appellate division coordinate power with the, the Court of Appeals to grant leave. Um, and so we know that they have granted it less frequently. Does anyone think that that's a good idea? Should the appellate divisions take a greater uh, uh, part in granting leave to uh, sending cases to the Court of Appeals? Or are they frustrated because they're, the cases that they send up are wind up on the SSM calendar? So, Brian, would you like to address that, or do you? There is a practice so in the Court of Appeals, if your case is SSM, you get a form letter to that effect, and you're invited to write the court, um, if you wish, uh, and explain why it should not be SSM'd. I suppose that probably that, in historically, maybe it's changed the case. I'm not aware of one. 
but it, it must have happened. Um, generally speaking, if you're a litigant, regardless of whether you're a repellent or respondent, generally speaking, you don't want to have a case SSM'd because you want to have an ability to brief the case and you want to have an ability to actually uh, speak to the judges and address whatever concerns they have. It's not a very popular with uh, attorneys uh, form of conflict resolution. So, yeah, uh, Bill Kasten. Um, so I practice exclusively in the second department and in the second department caseload as Judge Piggott said is enormous. I strongly believe that they are so familiar with these recurring issues in the criminal law that to take away this right of an appellate division judge to grant leave is really a, a misguided approach because they're familiar with it. They know it best. And especially in a criminal case where there's even a dissent, there's no guarantee the dissenting judge will grant leave. Now, if the dissenting judge felt strongly enough to write a dissent, which in my experience are usually pretty rare and um, pretty de detailed, to take away that power or to try to diminish their ability to bring this case to the Court of Appeals when there was a clear disagreement among the appellate division judges is really doing a disservice, not only to the Court of Appeals, but to the state, because there must be something in need of clarity. Um, so I, I, I think the appellate division judges should be, even if, regardless of whether it's put on the SSM calendar, it's still important enough if there's dissent in a criminal case to go to the Court of Appeals. There's uh, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask is whether or not the Court of Appeals is any in any better position to determine what cases are leave worthy than justices of the appellate division. We had thought of that, but I would, might frame it slightly differently. It, this is some thought that uh, the Court of Appeals is on the mountaintop and they can look down at everything and they can see where all the good issues are. They can see better than everybody else. There's another point of view is that uh, the judges in the appellate division are in the trenches. They see, they see 15,000 cases um, collectively a year. So the question is, do, don't, wouldn't they have a different perspective and sometimes a better perspective on what is really bothering them and what needs resolution? Because again, in 1896, they changed the, the, the whole system of uh, appellate uh, jurisdiction in this case and made the appellate division the one court to which you had sure access and the court of appeals only to sort of be like a service court to fix problems with legal issues so the my, my question would be doesn't the appellate division have a, an equally worthy and different perspective that needs to be credited uh, and not be cast aside to ssms but i confess I'm an appellate division guy, so. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let me double up on you, Jim, because you're, I think you're absolutely right. Keep in mind that the judges in the appellate divisions are all elected trial judges. They have been, they have been at the Nisi Prius level. They've, they've listened to arguments, they've listened to motions, they've decided cases, and someone decided that they ought to move up uh, to the appellate division, although, footnote, you never say lower court when you're talking about the trial. We always we always say the, the Supreme Court erred or Supreme Court because we're all Supreme, Supreme Court, Court judges, judges on the appellate division. Talented, uh, chosen, I think, because of their ability. Uh, and you're absolutely right, Jim. They, they have a, a knowledge uh, that's unique. And when you get to the Court of Appeals, you know, you end up with someone like Smith, you know, who's never been a judge. He just happens to be a genius. So you gotta, <laughs> you gotta deal with people like him. Yeah, well, I'm, Smith would like I'm, to I'm, I'm and... genius enough to agree with Piggott, uh, um, uh, which doesn't happen every day, but I, I, uh, I, I do, uh, and I want to add another reason for the conclusion that both uh, Jim Pilzer and Judge Piggott were um, uh, urging. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I tend to be a procedural or constitutional purist. Look, the authors of the Constitution decided that question. They said that the appellate division has a role in granting leave or appellate division justices have a role in granting leave. It is, I respectfully submit, inappropriate, though this is a criticism of two distinguished former chief judges, including one under whom I served and whom I loved and revered, but it is inappropriate for the Court of Appeals to be telling the appellate division justices how to do their jobs. The Court of Appeals uh, has, has plenty to, to do with its own, uh, they have plenty 
uh, of time to do their own jobs, uh, but they, they uh, and the uh, appellate divisions have certain roles reserved for them. Uh, I, uh, my, uh, no one unfortunately ever asked me um, for my opinion on this subject, but if an appellate division justice had ever asked me, or if there happens to be any appellate division justice listening now, my, uh, my advice on how you decide whether to grant leave to appeal is if you think the Court of Appeals should, rev uh, should review the case, you grant it, and if you don't, you don't, and that's all there is to it. And it doesn't matter whether the Court of Appeals wants to control its own docket or not. If they want to control their own docket, they should go, go, to the, go, uh, uh, go get the Constitution amended. So, uh, Judge, Judge Ritter. So, so one thing I want to add, and I think because this is a bar association program, we haven't talked about the role of lawyers putting together leave applications. And I, I think that's also a really important issue to mention. Um, and so many leave applications that come in, uh, not necessarily by the talented people on this panel or in this room or even on the video, their combined motions to re-argue and motions to leave for leave. And let's say 95% of it is, you got it wrong. And here's my re-argument. And then there's a paragraph or two or a page that just says, in case you're not granting re-argument, grant leave. Well, that's probably not gonna get leave granted either at the, but certainly not in a unanimous decision. So I also think there is a role, I hope we'll talk about it. Um, I don't necessarily, as an appellate division judge, I know what's in my docket. Um, I know what I saw as a trial judge, but after a while, you're pretty far removed from the trial court. You haven't been there for a few years. So I do think there is a role here for lawyers to be talking about statewide issues, issues, and often I didn't see it. People are very focused on their case, their department. Um, no one's telling you, you know what, this is an issue that's across the state. Like this decision is important. Law school professors are writing about it. Um, so I just think that's another thing we ought to think about is uh, particularly for non-institutional providers, individual lawyers, um, how, to, how to put this together so that the issues we're talking about are front and center for the court. Uh, Brian? Uh, to follow up on what I uh, totally agree with uh, Justice Richter, you know, as infrequently as the appellate division grants leave, they grant re-argument a lot less frequently. And generally, it's just not a good idea to tell a judge, to tell a panel of judges that just decided your case that they're all wrong. Um, it's probably a better strategy to tell them how important the issue is and that this is one where um, other reasonable people can differ and the Court of Appeals should hear it. Statistically, that's an argument that's far more likely to succeed. I just wanted to ask another question about interlocutory orders because they, that, that seems very, it's a place where only the appellate division can grant leave. And without getting into um, uh, my own war stories, Tom and I represented a client who had a very interesting issue before the appellate division, which involved federal preemption and would have ended the case. And it, the, the appellate division disagreed and sent the case back for trial. And it seems to me that in a, in, a question, in a situation like that, where you have to tell your client, if you're the lawyer, by the way, we're going to have to spend a fortune to try this case when we could win on the law and we think we have a great case on the law. Shouldn't lawyers really concentrate on making leave applications then and explaining to the appellate division why it's crucial to get the case up to the Court of Appeals if they think there's a good issue of law? Anybody want to address that? I don't know am I, if I told the whole story and uh, that's it. No takers. Okay. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come uh, briefly to the defense of lawyers who don't do that. Some cases just don't have a leave-worthy issue. Indeed, a lot of them. Uh, the, and uh, sometimes you're just, you, you, uh, the, the best you can do is take a shot at re-argument and, and then put in a paragraph at the end in case somebody wants to grant leave. Uh, you, you, you don't 
you, th th there are some cases where you just know you're not going to get leave, and there are certain, and there are more in which you can be pretty sure the appellate division isn't going to grant leave because not only did they rule against you, but they uh, they, they they did not. The appellate division made clear in its opinion they did not think you had a serious argument. Uh, often, and for that reason, I think some litigants. Uh, uh, particularly those who don't have infinite resources, simply skip the appellate division and, 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 and uh, don't move for leave in the appellate division, go directly to the Court of Appeals. I think uh, Professor Connors wants to address this issue as well. Thank you. Uh, just uh, a public announcement uh, for the bar. There's a great um, publication of the bar, Appeals to the Court of Appeals. It was originally written by Professor Siegel, and then Judge Shankman and Professor Siegel worked on the next edition. It's now in its fourth edition. This is very helpful to any lawyer out there who is making a motion before the appellate division or before the Court of Appeals for leave to appeal. Um, Judge Smith, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's an appellate division justice's job to decide these, these issues. And if it's leave worthy, I, I think they should play their role and, and grant leave. Um, but unfortunately, that's just the culture, I think. I know when I clerked at the court, the first department frequently granted leave, and we would have these, this is before your time, Judge, but we'd have these cases, the appellate division first department would reverse without an opinion, remember this? And then grant leave. <laughs> and, and the Court of Appeals had nothing to really, and I remember that the Court of Appeals did address that and said, as we have told the appellate division in the past, they should not reverse with no opinion and, and grant leave. Um, another important consideration, I, correct me if I'm wrong, fact checkers. There's only, I think, only Judge Canet, excuse me, Judge Troutman, has appellate division experience now in the Court of Appeals. Um, that's extremely valuable. And there was a point in time when there was no appellate division at the Court of Appeals. I think when Judge Fahey retired, that should be a consideration. I think in whether the appellate division grants leave because of the experience you have that might not be on the court. I don't mind saying that when I did continuing legal education, I would say to lawyers, if, uh, if there isn't a conflict among the appellate divisions, create one. And be a little <laughs> imaginative in how you're going to define your case, and maybe you'll have a chance of getting one. Sorry. Uh, sometimes there is a, a conflict between the first and second, but I, I know you recall that there was sometimes a conflict within the first. Um, and there's a great Article 16 issue that the first department issued two conflicting decisions on one day, intentional tort fees are in the application of Article 16 there. So you can have conflicts within a department. Um, and that's, I think, there. I think the leave application to the appellate division is probably um, more important. But again, Judge Rick, that's what you said. That's, that's doing your research um, and making sure that, you, you know, you are uncovering everything possible to support the leave application. So let me just also say, um, and maybe this has come now being away from the court a little bit, there are some issues that are just unique to each department or that predominate in certain departments. So I think, you know, this focus on the conflict uh, that is in the criteria, but I also think it, it's not so realistic. Sometimes it happens, but you know there aren't a lot of farmland cases out of the first department, and there are tons of mortgage foreclosure cases out of the second department, and fewer out of the first. So I, I think, um, again, you know, talk if there are issues that are recurrent in the trial courts, I definitely in the department and the trial judges are in conflict, which does happen, I, I, I certainly would say that is a way for lawyers 
to bring the issue of conflict. It doesn't just have to be the appellate divisions. It could be the trial judges within a particular borough or a department um, where the issue needs clarity. In the, in the criminal context, any conflict among the departments, I think, has to be an automatic leave grant. It, it, it can't be that a criminal defendant in Binghamton is treated differently than a criminal defendant in Brooklyn when it's the same issue. I mean, it, 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 I understand Judge Richter's point about very few farms in Manhattan, but there is, there is criminal defendants statewide, and they can't be treated differently based upon where the crime occurred. Now I am. Thank you. The, uh, the light actually looks bright to me even when it's off. So it's, it was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I keep doing this to everybody. All right. So let's, let's move on now to the criminal leave application issues that are raised uh, by the materials. Um, I, I don't think it's at all clear that there's a direct correlation between the number of criminal appeals that are heard and decided by the Court of Appeals and the way in which they get there, but there may be. Uh, and so I wanna give the uh, panelists a chance to discuss this issue. And given Judge Piggott's article that is in the material, I'm going to give him the first opportunity to address the issue. Thank you, Denise. Well, picture, picture anything that you can, uh, uh, whether it's cooking, whether it's sports, whether where you have teammates who don't talk to each other and who not only don't talk to each other, but have a certain amount of, of authority with, within the game, within the recipe, within, uh, but they're not gonna share it with you. And you then have to make your decisions and whether they get any farther or what, how they get decided is purely circumstance. It is the darndest thing to me that there is 2000 defendants who wanna be heard by the Court of Appeals that each judge gets 300 of them. Nobody knows who's got which ones. I'll take mine, for example. I get to decide these 300. And if I don't like the person, if I think I'm not granting leave on anybody that's, that's taller than me, which eliminates almost 70% of the population, uh, no one's gonna stop me. And, and I can just do that. And so it's troubling to me that we don't at least have a reporting requirement where they say, Judge Piggott, what did you do with the 300 cases? Obviously, you divide them up among the, 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 uh, uh, the sessions, but, but with the 30 cases or 40 cases that you've had before you since the last time we met, and I would explain that. We don't do that. On top of that, I get to decide it. I'm not a criminal, well, I am, but I mean in the, not a criminal, but a criminal lawyer, and I did this work. And I know the subtleties of, of motion practice. I know that if my client confessed, I'm not going to get that thing suppressed. I don't care if they use rubber hoses and everything else on this guy because they're not going to they're not going to suppress a confession. <clears throat> and that ought to be looked at. But I know that because I've done it. Most people don't because they don't do criminal work and criminal work is 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 special. It's different. So when I got to this and started doing doing these things I did my own I you know I, I had great law clerks but they were all new they, they they hadn't spent any time in this so I told them I would do them and I did and uh, what my little article talks about and I'll just take a couple minutes because there's uh, is the, the first case I talked about was a people versus nature finch now in this case got up to the Court of Appeals because I knew the lawyers they were from Syracuse they were great they had been in front of the appellate division a number of times, and we got joking about Nature Finch and whether he was related to Atticus, whether there was some connection there. It was more convivial than had anything to do uh, with the case as it, as it developed. To the point where I said to these two, I said, you know, you're, you're making such great arguments, I'm going to ask you to come down and talk to my colleagues. Mainly because I thought this would be a nice thing for their resumes that they argued a case in front of the Court of Appeals. Not everybody gets that chance. It gets there, and I'm telling you, I mean, the big deal was standing or preservation. I'm sorry, and you know, the, the half my you know saying this isn't preserved, it isn't preserved. 
Others said, yes, it is. I'm sitting there saying, what the hell did I create? And uh, ultimately, we split four to three. We, we reversed the conviction, uh, and we kind of made new law with respect to uh, preservation, which never should have happened because Piggott decides he's going to let his buddies come up and argue. That's how ridiculous this can get. On the other hand, Anthony Adone, St. Joseph's University student, he's home in Suffolk County. They're out on a Friday night, all the college kids, he's dancing on a table. Bouncer says, get off the table. He doesn't get off fast enough and a scuffle occurs. Bouncer dies. Adone's charged with murder. It turns out the bouncer is a correction officer from Sing Sing. And so they go to trial and uh, he gets convicted. He gets sentenced to 22 years, uh, goes to the appellate division. They, they confirm the conviction, reduce the sentence to 17 years, and it comes up to the Court of Appeals. One of the other judges on the court, not me, uh, it was Ted Jones, good, good judge and a great friend, uh, denied leave. It's over. But Judge Jones passed away, and the motion to reconsider came to me. I read this thing, and I, I am, I don't want to say I'm scared, but this is nuts. Uh, the trial lasted way too long, it seemed to me. The jury was out days and days. So I did what I probably should not have done. Uh, I went and looked at Newsday. I wanted to know what was going on in this thing. Newsday talks about a sea of blue. That in the courtroom, the, the brothers were there to to be there for, for their deceased uh, colleague. And so I'm looking at now at the transcript and I can see the defendant, defense lawyer couldn't breathe. I mean, <laughs> every, every motion, I mean, it was just one, it was a tough case for the judge. It was a tough case for everyone. So I thought, I can't decide this. What am I doing? So I granted leave. We unanimously reversed that case uh, on a number of issues. Uh, I think very properly so, sent it back for a new trial. It's supposed to go to trial and the, the family of the deceased didn't want to do it. They said, we, you know, this is enough. They allowed this, uh, Mr. Adone to plead down to a reduced charge uh, in return for time served. Uh, he's out, uh, I guess. And then I get a call about two years later from Judith Kay. And she said, I just want you to know, I was talking to one of the lawyers for Mr. Adone, and they said that uh, after he got out, uh, he got married, he has two children, and he's working in Manhattan. I thought it's a whole lot better than being in Sing Sing for the next 15 years. And uh, uh, somebody, you know, then went on, you know, when I was telling his story, went on uh, Facebook, and there he is with his kids and everything else. And I thought, geez, you know, because one judge, you know, decides these things, uh, this, this shouldn't be. And I, in talking to one of my former clerks, you know, I said, you know, some judges, the clerks decide this stuff. Are you kidding? Uh, I mean, if you've, if you've done this work and you know what goes into a trial and what goes into motions and everything else, it can't be decided in that fashion, in my view. Uh, so I wrote this thing and I think that we could take our, uh, our death clerks because Judge Smith decided that the death penalty was unconstitutional and each one of the judges has a, what's called a death I did clerk. not <laughs> what was called, called a death clerk so we have an extra clerk they could take those seven put them in the cracker jacks of, of central staff have them do criminal and we could review these things just like everything else and I don't think we'd miss a beat but boy I think it's so important I can't imagine uh, what's being missed uh, on a, on a almost weekly basis uh, because of the way we handle CLAs. End of speech. All right. Next. So, Mr. Kasten, I really want to give, this is a, a, an important question for you to address because yes. you see what issues are left out there uh, without leave being granted in the criminal appeals. Yes. I, I mean, there's a, there's a perception in, in, in many criminal appeals offices that it's a luck of the draw. So you file a leave application, it goes to one random judge in the Court of Appeals, some of which have, some of whom have no or little or no criminal experience prior to their current position. And I'll tell you anecdotally, in, in my office, if someone comes to me and says, I have a great leave issue, my first question is often not, what is the leave issue? My first question is, who's the judge? because that will play out to determine whether leave is granted. It's an unfortunate reality. The reality also is that many judges have preconceived biases like anyone else. 
And so to give only one individual the determination, often without a leave hearing, often without a reply um, letter to the leave, to the opposition to the leave, to give one individual the opportunity to make this decision instead of the full court of seven is, is just, it's missing many cases. I, I, New York's only one of only four states in which a single judge decides a criminal leave application. So the vast majority of jurisdictions do not do it this way. It doesn't have to be done this way. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I'll finish with, with um, besides agreeing with Judge Piggott and, and saying a full, full uh, staff of seven judges should decide these, in my office in the last six months, there have been three exonerations. One of them presented a leave-worthy issue. Well, I, in my opinion, it was a leave-worthy issue. The judge denied it. When the Brooklyn's Conviction Review Unit just exonerated this person, they specifically said in their report that the appellate division got it wrong. Now, if you have one judge deciding whether to grant leave and the consequences are that significant where this individual was incarcerated for more than 18 years before exoneration, that to me is the most telling indication why the system must change. Judge? Yeah, I just want to say a word. I mean, the case against the lottery system really is very compelling, and 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 as Judge Piggott and and uh, uh, Bell just made it very uh, convincingly. Um, there, I, I guess, there are two things uh, you, you might want to uh, 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 bear in mind. There's an institutional. There's, there's considerable resistance to such a major change. I think that's what's really going on. If you're a judge at the Court of Appeals and, and, and you read Pickett's article and you say, oh, this is, uh, uh, this is what we should do, you say, this guy wants me to septuple the work I do on criminal leave applications. I'm gonna, instead of getting one, I'm gonna get seven. Uh, I, I, I think that should be overcome and I think there, there's a way to overcome it, but I, I, I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind. It is also true that since um, the judge's time and the time they're gonna work is finite, um, the the effect of the so-called of, of what you might call the lottery system is not quite as extreme uh or it's at least it's not all it's not as different as you might think in the way other cases are handled uh, judge pickett confessed to you a while ago that in a lot of civil leave applications the uh, effective decisions made by one person who's not even a judge uh it's by one of those crocker they are very good by the way the, the the central staff the court of appeals i was astonished at how good they are but of course we uh, uh when when a, a motion a civil motion for leave comes and the clerk writes an opinion that clerk gets a lot of deference and it's relatively unusual that the clerk's uh, uh, view is overcome on us and uh, uh, and when it is when 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 uh uh the clerk's view is rejected and leave is granted, although the clerk wanted to deny it, or sometimes the other way around. That's really because uh, of the judge picked at random who was assigned to, to, to read that clerk's opinion. So there's a bit of a lottery that goes on behind the scenes, uh, whatever system you have. On the other hand, I think it is unfortunate and, and it doesn't look good and it isn't good to have the lottery quite as blatant as it is in the criminal leave application. Uh, this is Jim Pelzer. I just wanted to mention, I, I was going to ask that question, isn't a lot of the resistance caused by the fact that the judges in the Court of Appeals will say, well, you don't, you don't want me to do seven times as much work on these, uh, these leave applications, so that's out. We're not going to do it. But I hearken back to 2009, and when Judge Lippman came in, you saw how leave applications went way up. And I, one of the, one of the, um, factors involved in that, I think, was that Alan Pierce, who was in the back, wrote a very nice law review article, law review article in um, the Albany Law Journal about this very thing. And there was proposals that were active in the legislature at the time to amend the criminal procedure law uh, to uh, make this a, a leave applications in criminal cases something that the judges, all the judges had to decide. So in order to head that off at the pass, apparently there was uh, an effort by the Court of Appeals to grant leave more frequently. Um, so this may be the time when that is ripe, either to rejuvenate the applications, uh, the efforts in the legislature, or to rejuvenate the thoughts about 
uh, granting leave in the Court of Appeals. And hopefully that will, uh, this meeting today and our, our discussion may have some influence with respect to that. Can I just say a quick comment about the workload? Um, although 2000 does sound very daunting, obviously, but a, a fair amount of these leave applications are required to be filed by counsel because the rules of the appellate division state that if the client wants in a criminal case, a leave application filed, the attorney should file it. So some of these, the court does not have jurisdiction. Some of them are excessive sentence. Some of them are unpreserved. So I understand that the court is concerned about the workload, but in reality, the 2000 is not really 2000 substantive leave applications. Right. And, and just to follow up on, on the uh, mention of Alan Pierce's uh, law review article, which really goes through uh, a lot of the reasons why it might be a good idea to change the system at the Court of Appeals with regard to criminal leave applications. The Bar Association itself, the State Bar Association itself, at that time recommended statutory changes that would result in uh, line by line statutory changes that would result in full court review of criminal leave applications for many of the reasons that, that have been discussed here. So. You know, it may, it may be time to take a look at that again, um, uh, as uh, Mr. Peller, Pelzer had said. I, I think, Professor Connors, you had something you wanted to say? I, I had a question for uh, Judge Piggott, I guess Judge Smith. Judge Piggott, you mentioned in your article in the O'Done case that you um, conducted a hearing on whether to grant leave. What, are there standards for that? Um, and how would a lawyer seek that relief? I'm not on the court anymore, so I have no fear. One of the one of the one of the problems I have been told that there there were judges uh, that, as I say, delegated this to their clerks and wouldn't do them. I mean, even even if they the, the lawyers asked for them, and and Bill's right, by the way. I mean, of the of the three hundred, you get letters, you know, and, and it's all letters uh, saying I'm doing this only because you know I want I want to. Uh, exhaust his, his state rights. And I have an article or a, a case in here where uh, that was a big deal, that, that exhaustion was important. And some of them say I'm doing this and I'm not asking for oral argument and I'm not asking for uh, any further uh, report. And you know, you know, that they know they don't have anything. And so you could cut those, you know, those numbers down probably by 40 or 60%. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost your, I lost your question. Well, I was just wondering, yeah, what, what are the standards? What, what, what would, um, make you say i want to hear the lawyers out on this criminal leave application my rule just me you know was if you ask for it you get it and uh i'm, I'm of course in buffalo so most of them are, are uh, on, on by the by telephone uh it was always nice if there was a buffalo <laughs> lawyer i could actually get to talk to a real live lawyer uh now and again but if they ask for it they get it uh if they don't usually they wouldn't because i wouldn't think they were serious enough but if i had questions about it i would yeah, my uh, my practice was uh, was different. Um, uh, for me, the uh, the function of the what I called a conference, uh, the, the the leave conference, was uh, if I was disposed to grant, which is obviously in the minority, the, a small minority of the cases. If I see if I saw what I thought looked like a good leave application, uh, I would want to be sure I hadn't missed anything, and I would hold a conference. For me, the conference was essentially an opportunity for the party opposing leave to say, wait a minute, idiot, that thing wasn't preserved, uh, uh, or, or, or something to that effect. Uh, very, I, I found that I rarely changed my mind, and it had almost always granted leave uh, once I had held a conference. I think that was not untypical. I, I, there were judges who told me uh, before, uh, when I came on the court, just don't, don't grant leave without holding a conference, you're gonna be embarrassed. That, that, that uh, reminds me to, re to mention what I think is another very important factor in the whole problem of declining leave grants and leave applications, which is the a case is argued and, and, it's a real, and it turns out the issue is a stupid issue and everyone looks around and says, what idiot granted leave in this case? <laughs> um, you, um, your, uh, and the fear of that kind of censure, even though no one, of course, actually says it, they just give you a kind of a patronizing look, is a worry. I, I, I am a propagator of the loan officer theory. Uh, it is a cliche of the banking industry 
that a loan officer who has never made a bad loan is a bad loan officer because you must you 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 your job is to take a certain amount of risk and to and, and not just to make sure you never get a bad one but be sure you get a, a a sufficient number of good ones that applies to leave applications and if in the if any if i were giving advice there's another thing that i always wish someone would ask me and no one ever did but if i were giving advice to uh the court of appeals judges i would say look if you've never made a bad leave grant then you're not granting leave enough. You've got to grant more. So we're going to move on to another topic area, and that has to do with um, the difference between dissenting opinions in the intermediate appellate courts and in courts of last resort, like the Court of Appeals. So I, I'm, we saw in the statistics this thing that I call decisional dissonance, where the large proportions of um, dissents and concurrences. Uh, my question is, is there a difference in purpose of dissents and concurrences in the appellate division than in the Court of Appeals? I mean, we saw that the purpose of the Court of Appeals, according to the people who wrote our provisions in the Constitution, is to settle the law clearly and distinctly. and so is there is there some is it beneficial to have more dissents in the appellate division more disagreement in the appellate division and less disagreement in the court of appeals i don't know the answer to that i don't know whether dissonance is great in the court of appeals i know there are some authors and law professors who are interested and think it's great to have lots of dissents and and trial lawyers like them a lot um but the question is is that good for the law and is is our dissents good in the appellate division to set cases up for the Court of Appeals? Does anybody want to speak about that? Judge Ritter, you, uh, uh, Richter, you have uh, uh, experience at the appellate division. Did you? Sure. sure. I, I mean, I think, I don't know which is better for justice. So I, I, to me, I never signed an opinion I couldn't live with. If I didn't agree with the opinion, I wrote a dissent. I, I mean, that's or a concurrence um obviously or you try to shape the opinion and and see if you can get a majority um and i i think it was judge piggott who said at least for decision making i didn't sit there and think oh i'm gonna like write a dissent to set a case up for the court of appeals i can't sitting here today i can't think of a case i did that in or or that i saw a lot of those i mean there were dissents, and and maybe you'd write a few more paragraphs in the hope that somebody would join you on a leave application because you needed two votes and you might have a four to one. That definitely happened. But I guess my view of opinion writing is your name's on it. And so you, you're writing for these lawyers and these litigants. I don't know if that's too simplistic, but I think that's the answer. I would like to dissent from the idea that dissents diminish clarity or that the unanimous opinions uh, uh, promote clarity. I have always thought, and I'm convinced it's true, that a dissent, uh, uh, a dissenting opinion makes the law clearer. It may, uh, a good dissent makes you understand what the majority decides. It makes the majority clarify its opinion. It makes the majority less sloppy and more careful because they don't want to be shredded by the dissent. So I, I, I think dissents, if, if it's an issue of some significance, uh, which is uh, in, which, in which areas, uh, in, in areas where similar things will come up again, dissents are very helpful. I remember a specific case in which I, uh, 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 there were the key precedent was one in which Judge Hancock had dissented and written a very an excellent dissenting opinion. Uh, I, I had a, 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 a case to which that precedent was highly relevant, and I, uh, uh, I, I wrote the major I wrote for the court in that case. I did not go the way Judge Hancock might have wanted me to go, but I remember being very grateful that he had laid out for me what the issue was and, had, and, and, and helped me to articulate the reason why the particular decision should go that way. 
that said, I don't quite go as far as Judge Richter does. There have been times when I kept my mouth shut, even though it, I thought it was a pretty uh, uh, bad decision because it was on such a narrow, you know, it really is the interpretation of the peculiar words of a contract. It's never going to come up again. I thought it wasn't worth the trouble. I do think that clarity is diminished when you have a really fragmented court. Four threes are fine. A five twos are fine. Three, you know, when it's when it's three three one with a concurrence on some weird different grounds, or you know, judge, uh, or do what the Supreme Court does and scatter all over the all, all over the lot so that it takes a paragraph this long just to just to recite which judge said which. That I think does diminish clarity, and that I think uh, that um, uh, uh, judges should struggle to avoid. There are also some cases where there is so much emotion involved or so of such high political significance that it's good for the court to be unanimous because it, it, it helps the court's institutional credibility. So there's a corollary to the question I asked, which is that some, it, it, it's whether a chief judge should strive to uh, uh, obtain consensus or build consensus, or whether that's really not necessary. Does anybody want to speak about that? I don't mind weighing in on that. Uh, Judith Kay used to, you know, if, if it looked like something was up, uh, she said, why don't we take a look at this tomorrow? And she'd move it off. And I don't know what 24 hours means, except by the time we come back, usually we're a whole lot closer to being unanimous than we were before. Uh, she had a, uh, an art of persuasion that was, that was really quite, quite remarkable. I don't know if anybody's got the statistics. I would think that there were fewer dissents and or concurrences under Judith Kay than there were under Jonathan Lippman. There were. And that makes sense to me. I mean, John was a, a great chief, uh, but he counted. He, his were the numbers. If there's four going one way, that's it. We're done. You know, and uh, uh, and so I think there were more dissents. I, I well, I was, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add, um, I actually want to modify my answer because I think I'm in accord with Judge Smith. What, I, sometimes you do you do sort of say, let's try to narrow this decision so it can be unanimous because it's never going to come up again, or because I the the four or five depending can live with this outcome. So I, I don't think I'm saying you write a dissent every time somebody's got a sentence or two or three that you think wouldn't be in there. Um, Brian, did you want to chip in on this? There's an article in the materials by uh, Justice Acosta, uh, mainly to the effect of what Judge Smith just said, it's iron shapes iron, that the dissenting opinion helps clarify the majority opinion. But beyond that, uh, I've never really understood, I've seen no empirical evidence for the proposition that dissents are bad, that they they muddy the law. Of course, there are instances, some of them are famous, where with the passage of time, uh, uh, a dissent became later on the majority. There was one a few years ago, 2019, where the majority opinion from the Court of Appeals was very significant, uh, 159 MP, and did not last the year because it was legislatively overruled on the basis, I think, of a telling dissent. But for all of those cases, there are all these 4-3 decisions, which posterity doesn't remember were 4-3 decisions. Uh, Holt versus County of Tioga is a 1982 4-3 Court of Appeals decision, where the court, by that narrow margin, uh, found that localities had authority to enact prior written notice laws. That's that's ages ago in, in terms of the law. We're way, we're so far beyond that. Who remembers, who recalls, why does it matter that at that point in time, there were three dissents? There is a 1993 case called uh, North Star Reinsurance, which dealt with the concept of anti-subrogation and held that in certain instances, an insurer who represents, who, who insures the defendant can't bring a claim against a third party defendant where it's the same insurance company because you'd be against your own insured. That was a 4-3 decision. The law would be completely different if it was 4-3 the other way. 
But it doesn't lessen the presidential value of either of those cases. Everyone understood there's a majority and there's a dissent. And the law is what the majority says. And the dissent may be helped shape what the majority says. All right, so we're running a little short on time. So uh, we're gonna pick and choose among some of the questions that are in our materials uh, to address this issue. Um, in former years, at the conclusion of a day's argument, the court retired to the robing room where the judges of the Court of Appeals would withdraw cards out of a hat or turned over on the table to, be, to see who would be the reporting judge, the lead judge during the discussion the next day when the vote was taken. In more recent years, I, it's my understanding, it's our understanding that that system has changed and that the judges who are going to be assigned to take the lead during the discussion of that case in the consultation room know days a week, weeks in advance of the oral argument and the next day's uh, discussion. I wonder whether any of you would like to speak to your views as to whether which way of doing business in the Court of Appeals, given its caseload and how different it is than the appellate division caseloads, uh, is in, 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 in the court's ability to best serve its constitutional role. The old way was better. Without question, and I, they can't impeach me now because I'm not there, <laughs> but when that started, I refused to go along. I would not pull a card beforehand, and I got into a great dis discussion uh, with my colleague, Eugene Fahey. Uh, I said, if you pull a card, I'm not working on that case because I know you, I know you're good at it, and I know you're gonna write a nice decision. That's one case I don't have to, and he's told me to stop being a jerk. <laughs> but I think it, 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 diminish, it, it diminishes the, the way we do things. And it was, it was interesting to know that you've heard all the arguments and now in the red room you're going to draw a case and uh it was it was kind of fun i i kind of look forward to that and uh but once it's gone i mean once you know you know here comes you know here comes brian shoot i don't have to worry about him because i know his case is going to be decided uh by judge fahey and i can take a break and that that helped me because he used to scare me when he came up Judge Smith, do you want to address that question? Well, I know. I, uh, strangely enough, I agree with Pigott again. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, that leads me to a question that someone asked and sent a note up to me. And we'll, I want to give some time for these questions, but this is related. So presumably, that new, the new system was to reduce the time needed for the judges to, was to, to make it more, more efficient use of the judges' time. Uh, both of you were on the bench during the years when there were 200 or more uh, caseload dispositions a year. Was that too much work? It just, you know, honestly, is there, is, is there good reason to make optimal, to, to reduce the caseload so that the, the court is in a better position to optimally decide cases? Based on your experience in the workload at the court when you had the 200 or 200 plus cases to decide each year. Maybe you just think that, you know, whatever was done when you were a youth of 63 or whatever I was, uh, was all with that, that the, 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 you, your youth was the golden age. So things were just right then and they're worse now. Uh, but I, I did think that the, that the case order was about right. I worked quite hard, but I didn't think I had too many cases. I thought I had lug the luxury of, tr of trying to go deeply into each case if I worked hard enough. And uh, I, uh, I do not see the, the rationale for cutting the, the cases down from 200 to 80 or whatever has happened. I, I, I kind of doubt that anyone set out to do that. I, uh, my, as I keep saying, I think it's more a reflection of some people see a lot of cases they like, some don't. Yeah, I would agree. I can't say that I worked harder as a judge than I did as a lawyer. And uh, I mean, people who work, lawyers work, lawyer, lawyers, don't sleep. Lawyers have, you know, weekends that they spend. Uh, when I became a judge, uh, I stopped thinking what, no, I didn't. But uh, it's obviously much easier as a judge uh, when you're, you're staffed, you have law clerks, you have uh, all the facilities you could possibly want uh, that I, I just don't see it. I, I did not work uh, harder as a, as a judge as I did as a lawyer. 
So it is now four o'clock and we have the one, one or two final questions. And I like to call those questions the Goldilocks questions. Um, um, this, this porridge is too cold, this porridge is uh, too hot, this porridge is just right. So the question is, the Goldilocks question is, what is the annual number of uh, decided appeals and associated business that the court to which the court can accord meaningful attention? What's its optimal caseload in your views? Uh, it's 90 too little, is 300 too much, is 200 just right? Is there, what's the, what's the, What's the porridge is just right number? Anybody want to weigh in on that? The person that ought to answer that is Stuart Cohen, and unfortunately, he's not. Oh, wait a yeah, minute! There he's he is, right there. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I couldn't make a determination. I, you know, what we had, we had, and uh, two hundred was not too many. I mean, it was fine. Anybody want to weigh in? I, I would just say generally. I, I, obviously, I want to hear from Judge Smith on this. But I see some people I know, Alan and, and Mike Cutter, Tom Newman clerked at a time when you know, the one judge dissent and it went up to the Court of Appeals. That was probably too much. And then when I clerked from 88 to, to 91, that was when there was a constitutional change. You needed a two judge dissent. Uh, Stu, you might recall, I think we were in the 380s or 390s at that time. I thought that was, we worked hard, but I, I thought it was manageable. And now, you know, I don't, I don't understand how, how you would, you know, I, I just don't understand how you could say what the case of today is too much, but anyway. Yeah, well, I've already said that, you know, the days of mine, the days of my youth and it was 200, things were more perfect. Um, I, I, I guess I would add that I, uh, if you'd asked me whether it would be worse to have to, to have a higher number than a lower number, I'd say we could deal with a higher number. We don't need to, we don't need to cut back. So okay. I would just add that, that I'm troubled at the idea of setting a number because to go back to where the appellate divisions aren't gonna have any idea what the number looks like. And so I sort of would say, you know, if every appellate division said, five more cases that already, I mean, I'm not, I'm just picking a random number, whatever it is, but, but the idea that there's a number as a, it really is troubling to me, as opposed to, um, let, let's encourage this conversation to continue and see what happens. Yeah, the, the question wasn't intended to set a number. The question was kind of like, what's too little, what's too, right. no, what's I too much. What's the, where is it hover around about the right amount? So, and, and that is something the Court of Appeals will be deciding uh, in the future. So I think we can uh, pause. We've, we've gone through our questions and we wonder whether or not there are any questions from the persons in the audience uh, and whether or not there's anyone online who wants to send in a question in the chat and we'll try to see whether or not those can be answered. So is there anyone here in, in person who would want to ask a question, there's a microphone there, you can turn it on and come up and ask one. We've answered all questions. So. I've had a couple of questions delivered to me that have not been answered. Some of, some of them actually have been, one moment please. Some of them have been answered in, the, in due course of our discussion, so I'm not going to re-ask them, but one of the questions that came in was, does the quality and reputation of the appellate counsel have an impact on leave applications? We've addressed that a little bit. Uh, does anyone want to address that further today? The answer is yes. And of course, you'd rather have uh, other things being equal. You want a case with good lawyers. And indeed, I, have, I can think of a case where I, actually, come to think of it, I denied leave because uh, there was a, it was a, a case, it was, an, an important issue in a criminal case, uh, and the lawyer applying for leave put it as uh, we had it was one of those. Uh, I got 37 reasons for granting leave, and this was reason 35. And I said this issue should not be presented by this lawyer. Uh, then, uh, then another lawyer presented the same issue, presented it correctly. Uh, they came up at the same time. They raised the same issue. Uh, I retracted my earlier decision, I called a leave conference and granted leave in both. All right, well, I have, a, I have a question here. 
it appears that it's a question from Chief Judge Wilson. <laughs> uh, it is. I'd appreciate the panelists' thoughts on the following two options for changes to the CLA procedure. One, go back to the ancient system where the losing party in the aptive could pick the Court of Appeals or Appellate Division judge from whom to seek leave, or two, send each CLA a, to two Court of Appeals judges randomly and with either able to grant leave. What are your thoughts? I would try both. <laughs> um, I think the second one's better because it gives, a, it gives more eyes on the leave application and more backgrounds from these individual judges to, who may be more familiar with the issues. So I think the more, whatever proposal is passed, the more judges who consider the leave applications, the better. So I would just say in the appellate division, I'm thinking about when, when we had bail and people could pick, it, there was something awkward about having been picked by a lawyer to hear an application. Um, and then, frankly, you start to see a pattern. If you grant that application, that lawyer is then back again. Now, again, that's not on leave. Um, and, and I know other, you know, so I just share that perspective. Um, and you sort of don't want to become that, that person's go-to all the time. Um, so I just throw that out. Yeah, I, I would I would say that the um, the first proposal I would I would think is just unworkable. What's going to happen is one judge is going to get all the leave applications, and, uh, and or one judge will get. I, I guarantee you, there are some judges who will get none. Uh, and uh, yeah, it it, it, it just it, it won't work. Uh, the second one I think would be an improvement. Although I I would be inclined if it's workable to go to go all the way with Judge Pickett and essentially assimilate the. Um, uh, the criminal leave applications to the civil leave applications. I, I, I think that's true. I, I'm going to agree with Judge Smith, believe it or not. And uh, uh, the thing of it is that th th there's seven judges. Some of them have never seen a criminal case. I mean, they, they get to the Court of Appeals, but they may not have done that. The appellate divisions all have. They've all been trial judges. They've all, you know, and, and within the course of their appellate work, have, have learned and heard and argued uh, criminal cases. Court of Appeals, that isn't true. And so to, to do it, just as Judge Smith is saying, you know, you're going you're gonna to unbalance the whole thing. But that's why I'm in favor of central staff. I'm a fan. All right. Any other questions? All right. So at this point, uh, Catherine, you can take this back, please. It is now a little after four o'clock and we can stay to discuss this, but I want to certainly take the opportunity to thank various people who contributed to this discussion. First and foremost, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, you've traveled a long way, you've given a lot of thought, you've read a lot of materials, and I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your willingness to share your thoughts with everybody here and virtually today. Thank you very much. Well, no, wait, 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 wait. I want to thank a few other people, all right? I want to thank uh, the Bar Association president, president, Sherry Wallach, and the CCAJ leader, chair, uh, Michael Miller, for their steadfast support of uh, this program. Very much appreciated. I want to thank the members of the subcommittee that have worked so hard to put this program together thoughtfully, respectfully, uh, to, to provide a discussion forum for these issues. Uh, those include uh, Norman Olch, Alan Pierce, um, Patty P Pasner is not here. Especially want to thank Tom Newman and Jim Pelzer. They've put, particularly Jim, has put in just, as I think he said, hundreds of hours of work in preparing his program and also for the article that really was the, the wellspring for the program. Um, and I want to thank the people at the Bar Association, Catherine, Gina, and anyone else who's helped make uh, this program possible today. It's a lot of work. And again, uh, I wish you all well. And thank you again for starting this discussion. Special thanks to Tom for conceiving the idea in the first place. <laughs>